Good afternoon. Well, um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, thank you for Will not to be coming to South Africa, giving me the opportunity to talk about a little bit about my work. Um, thank you for, to Ravi and his team and to uh, Linda for uh, making, making it happen for me to come here. Um, Ravi was um, quite, quite um, I said, uh, he said, uh, what, 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 do you want, what should I talk about? And, I, and he said, uh, just talk about what you're passionate about. So I, I've actually taken it uh, quite literally and uh, gone through a sequence of the things that I'm really passionate about in, in architecture. And uh, to, prepare, to prepare my talk, I sort of um, imagine w w the, the big issues, and one of which would be uh, for what is for me the essence of architecture, which is discovery and generosity. I'll come back to that. Uh, moving on to uh, creating uh, the, uh, buildings that are very specific to their sites. And, and the issue of talking about place. Moving on to how do you create communities and the consultation process or otherwise, uh, how, how do we create communities? Moving on to uh, sustainability, but in a slightly different way than usual because I want to talk about lifestyle sustainability. Uh, and then talking a little bit about the structure of our, of our studio, Studio A Grey West, which we started, as uh, Andrew said, uh, 18 months ago, and, how, how, and the work that we're doing currently. Discovery and generosity. The, the key thing here for me is that if, if you know what you're going to design before you've designed it, uh, there is no sense of discovery, and all you're doing is repeating what what somebody has done before. And therefore, um, to sometimes one is too eager to fill in the the blank page and 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 put something that one already knows and 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 jump to a conclusion. And so, one of my passions is is actually to withhold the moment when you know what you are going to do to really, in a way, enter the realm of not knowing before you go into the room of discovering and knowing what the answer is to the problem. Um, and one, and hand in hand with that, uh, the issue of uh, generosity. If architecture is not generous, it would be called building. And therefore, you, if you start to imagine yourself in the building, in the place that you're designing, and you just think about how you can make life better and how you can make it more interesting, and, and what will the, all the touches that will make a space uh, more exciting, more inspiring, then you're creating nobility, then you are, you are true to your, to your role as an architect. Um, and one, one of the, the buildings that probably changed uh, my life was to design a library in Peckham in the south of London, uh, which, which is something that I had never done before. I had never designed a library, nor, nor, nor had Will. And we went on to discover what the library could be. And rather than having the usual building that was standing on the ground that was, uh, had a uh, formal entrance, we decided to lift the building 10 meters in the air, which would be visible from afar, which would create a space underneath it for other events to take place, such as um, market stalls and so on, which actually do happen now. Um, create a beacon. And then inside, inside that building, you know, at the back of the building, we created a really transparent envelope so that people in the vicinity could actually read the building like if it was a, an elevational plan, so you knew where the library, the IT center, and so on were placed and therefore it made it more inviting. And then inside, these extraordinary pods made out of timber really created a moment of magic because one of the, the problems of the librarians was to do with how do we get children of between the age of 10 and uh, 15 to go to a library? They had a real problem. And these pods created that magic, that moment where every kid in, in the area said, you must come up to the library and come and do your homework there. And therefore, the, the library now is full from, from, uh, from morning to evening uh, and, f and is actually a noisy place and a completely new kind of library. Then, 
linked to that process of, of discovery, uh, there is uh, something that I'm passionate about, which is to avoid any kind of uh, predictable style. Uh, and again, this is the process of, of withholding doing something that you already know. And to devise through drawing, through painting, through talking, through modeling, to devise new ways of discovering forms that are not as uh, formulaic as, as, as if you were just picking a form from before. So, for instance, this was the, um, the project for the fourth grace in uh, Liverpool, in the north of England, which started as a, a, a circle, a, a sphere, that was deformed with uh, electronic magnet, if you want, to create this form. And we decided that that would be the building. Or suddenly we, we started to think that that could be the building and then use it as a way of developing that idea. The building, so you know, is uh, uh, one level of offices, one level of hotel, one level of exhibition space over a landscape that is undulating under which there is a maritime museum and then at the very top there is um, a, a viewing gallery. And then the iconography that is around it, it relates to the history of uh, Liverpool from the Beatles to the introduction of the banana to the potato and so on. So we, and, and so the building developed into this series of three donuts that were uh, superimposed on top of each other with this gigantic ring uh, void at the center leading up to um, a viewing gallery. And we, were, and we experimented with how could we make the, the facade tactile changing, ever changing with the light and, the, and your movement around that structure. So we imagined large white clouds stuck onto the facade. We imagined sort of a porcupine structure that blew in the wind and actually enriched the, the visual appearance of the building. And at the top, a garden that would be half vegetation, half uh, artificial, uh, sort of a, a new kind of uh, landscape. And this building would sit uh, on the waterfront next to the three other graces which were or belonged to the previous century as a sort of symbol of Liverpool moving to the 21st century with uh, a new uh, modern architecture that is that had no style that just belonged to today and that is the the building is as it was finally presented to uh, the politicians and their financiers and f I think more through lack of political will than anything else uh, the, the building was uh, was dropped um, Liverpool wasn't quite ready for, for this building. And so moving on from, uh, from this issue of specificity, from, of uh, discovery and generosity to no star, I'm interested in not about so much creating a building, but to create a place. And if you start with thinking of the place rather than the building, you're in a much better position to, to discover um, what you're trying to, 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 to create. And to give you an example, this is a, a research laboratory for 400 researchers in, uh, in London near Whitechapel. And before that, those, those 400 researchers were working in sort of uh, rabbit warrant Georgian houses, completely not exchanging work between them, completely separate. And we, we, we offered the brief, if you want, was for us to bring the, all the, the researchers together so that somebody in charge of um, uh, homeopathy would be talking to somebody in charge of cancer and be able to share, share their research before, before it was being published in Nature magazine or elsewhere. And uh, uh, the first painting was the painting of how do we bring all these people together and what does that space feel like? And the painting is this, we imagine a, a sort of cube, a glass cube, in which floating in that space would be meeting rooms, conference spaces, uh, lecture halls, and then in yellow, maybe some platforms floating in the space. That became refined into a glass box and then next to it 
uh, a muse. Traditionally, a building like that would have um, an atrium, a private atrium. We wanted research to become more public and, and to integrate itself within the grid of, of, uh, of the streets of London. So we created a, a muse which was public and which allowed the public to look into what, what was taking place in that research laboratory. And then the blue element you see in the background is the, the wall of plant, the plant, the, 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 emanic, the, the mechanical and electrical elements of the building completely separate from the research laboratory. And then through, through the process of drawing, uh, we looked at the section and these, these, three, these four objects floating into, into the space and then refining it to the point where we were being very specific about the objects that were floating in that space. And, and the inspiration came from talking to one of the researchers who, looking very closely in his uh, microscope, was actually able to give uh, extraordinary uh, emotions to every, every different cell. So some cells were aggressive and ferocious and others were genteel and others were neutral. And, and so suddenly that, that became the, the sort of guiding, guiding idea of creating these floating objects that would have different qualities um, and would, ha would sort of reflect the, the beauty that is hidden in the microscope and, and only with the, the eyes of the researchers to the greater public. And at the same time, what was intriguing is to create within this glass box uh, a non-perspectival space, a space that is similar to uh, being in, inside an aquarium and, and then passing through spaces and probably quite similar to uh, the motion of cells within uh, within a, within a liquid. So we we and w one of our uh, main problem was how do we get 400 researchers on one single plane? And we had to to actually create uh, a space below ground, sub subterranean, with the glass box becoming the the light the light well to the main space. And this is the, the space as it's not currently um, occupied. It's not what well, it is occupied now, but this picture was taken a little bit before the researchers moved in. So the, the, the black and white um, pod is called, the, we've called it the mushroom pod, and it's a sort of, it's at ground level and it's your reception level. We, the, t the picture is taken from uh, below ground level looking upwards. State of the art uh, research laboratories below ground. And, very, and very conducive to, to research space and office. Uh, ten, it, the tendency is for research laboratories to be very sanitized, to be very um, dry, to be like a hospital. And we try to put color, we try to put form, we try to create a different way of um, of creating an in, a working environment. So this is the service of the pod, and then you see in the far, in the, far uh, the seminar pod, which is called the cloud, and in the and further back, uh, the black pod, which is uh, for small lectures. And then the, the muse that I talked about at the beginning, which becomes in the summer a place for people to have lunch and, and eat out and walk and so on. The, the, the entrance is actually on the right, and the bridge connects you to, to the research laboratory itself. That's, so that's the glass box, whereas on the right is the, uh, the, the wall of plant and the reception. And one element that I haven't shown you yet is the center of the cell, which is a science center, which is accessed through uh, this uh, lobby and leads you into uh, the orange pod, which inside has explains to the children from 10 to 15 uh, what is happening uh, about their health, but also what is happening about the research in the laboratory. And this is uh, the, the object that is uh, finished, made out of uh, um, fiberglass. Very, very actually relatively similar. It looks complex, but it's actually two forms that are repeated uh, to form this, uh, this shape. And that floats above the space. 
and we couldn't invite the public inside the research laboratory itself. So that is, if you want, an object that looks down onto, onto the research, research laboratory. And whereas orange is a theme on the outside, inside the, the, the lecture hall for 400 people is the, uh, the, the, green, the green space with a few touches of um, poppies in the, in the seating. The, the next issue that I'm uh, very interested in is engaging the community and creating a community. They are actually two separate things. David, David Adjie this morning talked about his um, suspicion about community engagement, community participation, and because of the sort of implication that if you are in communi uh, communicating, uh, engaging the community, you are actually just tricking them into designing what you want them, what you want to them to draw, f what you would like them to draw. And I don't agree with that. I think that engaging the community is about listen, the, the role of the architect from uh, Corbu in, in, the in the days of the Corbusier to even closer to in the 80s and the 90s, the architect's role was very much about telling other people how they should live and, and designing accordingly. And that backfired. So that certainly in England it backfired and architects were responsible for creating uh, places that people didn't want to live in. Uh, and in recent years, there is a new kind of participation that has taken place where the architect takes on the role of orchestrating uh, a, a community's aspiration and desires in a way that... Um, so the, the role of the architect is to really listen, to take in, and, to, and, and he or she knows how to put together the... the the, the, the architectural element that creates beauty, surprise, color, and so on, which the community as a whole probably doesn't know how to do. And I'll come, I'll come back to the, to the issue of how do you create a community, because that is a, a, a lot more difficult. But I want to talk to you about a project in, uh, in Manchester called the Millennium Village. The Millennium Village is a series of uh, uh, programs in England to create exemplar housing and developments uh, that have uh, high sustainability levels, that are of the right density, that are well built and so on. And there's a series of five across the country and Manchester is one of them. And we inherited a site on the outskirts of Manchester. Manchester is probably third, fourth biggest town in England, um, which has, which is the epicenter of the industrial revolution in, um, in, in England with the mills and the cotton mills that, that were exported to the rest of the world. But we also inherited about 600 homes which were uh, awful in terms of their public realm, in terms of their construction, in terms of um, the layout of the streets and in, in particularly in terms of the density and therefore we inherited something that we had to demolish but there were still a few, a few people in the community that had uh, either not been rich enough to leave or had decided they wanted to stay. And the crucial issue here is that in 1940 the same area had a density of 10,000 people and in the 60s the, those new houses that you saw boarded up had a density of 7,000 and what that meant is that over a period of about 20 years, the health center closed, the convenience store closed, the, the, the roads felt empty and therefore were less secure, and little by little that, that bit of community f fell apart. And so our role was to, uh, first of all, to engage with the community and also to uh, re-intensify this community. And our site uh, was between two canals, and what we created is a new canal that linked the two together, south-facing curve, looking over a park with a series of radiating buildings from the back. That was the initial concept. And we took it to the, to the community and discussed that at, at length. 
and we we had to use a certain tricks because what most people want to do naturally is to talk about the home, the house, and so how do you get how do you engage people to talk about their health center, their school, their park, and so on was actually quite difficult. Uh, but through drawing, through um, three-dimensional models, and more drawings, we created. Uh, what we refer to it not as a master plan, but as a framework plan. The framework plan is something that has the elements of a master plan, but has a very much more movement about it in terms of how, how it changes in the future. Uh, and, and it was tested with models and so on. And the, 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 the crucial quality that we wanted to inject in it is that the, all the buildings were different on the side. And at the time, that sounded I mean, that, that sounds normal now, but at the time that was actually quite um, seminal in, as an image of a series of buildings very different, which would be obviously given to different architects in the future. Uh, and it was a master plan or framework plan that, ha that would, didn't run away from saying what kind of architecture it should be and, and started to give character and emotion to, to the place it was trying to create, uh, all the way to the boats and the l landscape and the vegetations and the market and the colors and the connections and so on. So, and uh, I'll come back to that later on, but one of the main issues about uh, Studio Agro West is about uh, how urban design and architecture marry with each other in, in equal parts. We made a model. And, and the first building to be built is called CHIPS, which uh, Allsop is, is designing currently, and I think is currently on site. Our new studio uh, is called Studio Agri West. This is our, our logo, which is a circle made out of a splotch of paint with a finger that's sort of turned into, into, the, into the paint. It's a, it's, it's, the paint is about creativity, it's about discovery, it's not a perfect circle, nothing should be perfect. Um, and, I, and so my, my, my next passion is our studio, which is, this was about six months ago when there was nine people, this is now 12. Um, but it's a very, um, we, we've been very careful to call it a studio rather than an office. We never go to, to the office, we go to the studio. And we have extraordinarily talented people, so we, we've been very selective about who we have, and everybody is able to multitask. And we have this space where on the left you can work, there's a big table on which you can meet, and then there's another large table to make models and to paint. And there's fantastic light, and then below you can see a fantastic view of, um, of London, and for those who know, uh, Simples is just here. Um, then this brings me to talk about uh, David West, who's an urban designer, probably the best urban designer that I know. And he and I worked together on the uh, New Islington um, Millennium Village that I showed you previously. And we built an extraordinary rapport. And I suspect he's a frustrated architect and I'm a frustrated urban designer. And, but he has the skill of storytelling, of really looking at the bigger picture, um, whereas I'm probably more interested in the articulation of architecture. But we've also brought in a new person in our office who's, uh, who, who's in charge of landscape, uh, arch uh, landscape architecture and who we, were f we felt that we had the sort of there was a, a missing element in our in our palette, which was to do with the space between buildings. Uh, what is unusual about uh, urban design and architecture coming together is usually you have either a large planning or urban design practice with a bit of architecture, or the reverse. But it's very rare that they come in equal parts. But if a, if a client comes and, talk, and says, I have a site, big or small, there is always the, the bigger picture. How do you connect to the public transport? What is going to happen to the site next door? Um, how do you get people from here to the convenience stores? 
And all these questions are urban design questions, whereas um, architecture resolves another set of issues. To bring them together is actually very interesting. And one of our first uh, projects was to deal with uh, Park Hill, which is a project in uh, Sheffield, in the north of England. It's, the, it's a typical uh, uh, Corbusian unité d'habitation sort of uh, extrapolation that was tested in, in Sheffield for uh, a, a thousand homes. It's separate, slightly separate from the city, it sits on the hill. Um, and it's, it's, very, it's a very clever building, but it's a very brutal and a very uh, uninviting building and completely creating a sense of fortress. And over the last, um, it was built in the 60s, it's become the largest listed building in, in England and probably in the world. And we were asked, uh, and therefore it could, couldn't be demolished. And therefore the council was stuck with something that was falling apart and asked us, uh, to see what we could do. Uh, so our first, uh, we, we followed our Ten Commandments, which was to, first of all, what would it be that creates a place and, and a community? And it was about creating shops and, and being specific about certain things. Containing the space, there was large areas of, uh, that were uncontained. Uh, opening the sense of uh, entry so that it was no longer a ghetto, being very clear about what was private space and, and public spaces, dealing with a car which was um, an issue that didn't exist in the 60s but became very relevant in the, in the today. And then most of all, dealing with the public realm, the element that, that hadn't been cared for for, for those for 40 years, 50 years. So this is the plan as it stands today. The, the, the landscape around it is um, without any special qualities, without any specificity. And our role was to uh, bring this plan to life. First by creating a, a park, a public park that linked it back to the city, creating allotments around the uh, uh, private gardens around an allo a communal allotment, creating a wild meadow, wildflower meadow landscape, a parterre garden, a bowling, bowling green, and then a sort of undulating uh, landscape towards a new supermarket, a new health center, and a new uh, nursery. And then creating a series of bars that face south and look towards the city, and then reemphasizing the, the connections with uh, the station and the city. And to illustrate that, we, well, first of all, did a few sketches. This is the, 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 new, the new proposal for the car park, which refers to the uh, white, white ro roses of, uh, of Yorkshire, which is where Sheffield is. And the, and the, the multi-story car park is actually, uh, has ends which, with incubator units for offices. So it's not just a, a car park. And we created four images. The first one was to show the connection with the city center and, and no longer creating a sense of ghetto. Then opening parts of the concrete to create great sense of entry, creating areas for children to play, and rom romancing the whole, the whole brutalist architecture without, with still while respecting the listed building element of it. And then in the center, creating a, a village green with a series of shops. You can see the, the car park on the left. Um, a series of convenience stores that were similar to, to one of my favorite streets in London called Exmouth Market, which happens to have the most extraordinary shops one after the other and really creates a sense of extraordinary community. And then changing the ground level of, the, of Park Hill to bars and restaurants that overlook uh, the city and actually create a destination as well as a, a place where people live. And this is the, this is the model 
uh, that was finally presented. And this is now going to planning, and we hopeful that it will be successful and will completely transform this, what was nearly ready to be demolished into a, a, a two-thirds private and one-third affordable housing uh, residential destination. Sustainability is on everybody's lips and I've noted that at the Indaba we are planting 2,000 trees and we've, we've been lucky to work with uh, a company called Bioregional who uh, created in, in England something called BedZ which was a sort of uh, test bed for uh, sustainable housing with south facing uh, passive solar he solar um, heating and uh, all all the the best knowledge that we could they could master on uh, on sustainable architecture and they found something that was very interesting which is that well first of all let me backtrack a little bit they created uh, uh, something called one planet living one planet living refers to um, the fact that w we in Britain and maybe elsewhere um, consume the energy that would be that three planets which would require three planets to uh, supply and therefore it is not our, our lifestyle is not sustainable and one planet living means that we have to tailor our use of energy to, to, the, to the energy provided by one planet. But what is interesting is that I always thought and assumed that energy like gas, electricity, petrol was the, the, great, the great problem. But it actually it turns out to be one of the smallest problems. The biggest problem is food. Food in terms of uh, production, in terms of its travels across the globe, in terms of its waste, in terms of uh, when we fill our fridge and, and throw half of it away. Um, a, a Kiwi flying from Australia to London uses its weight in petrol, which is, and the, so uh, if we start to deal, if we deal with food more than with energy, we're actually dealing with sustainability in a much more interesting way. So that that's that's what I meant by lifestyle sustainability, creating places uh, that are conducive to creating communities that understand how to live in a more sustainable um, way. Interestingly, I was noting on the, on the website that uh, Af uh, South Africa is one of the, um, the target places for uh, one planet living communities. And one, we, had the, we have the, uh, currently the opportunity to uh, discuss the, um, uh, to create, um, sorry, I'll backtrack again. Um, this is a, a master plan for Middlesbrough in, uh, called Mid Middlehaven, which is a landscape, uh, which is very interesting because the landscape is, is edible. So every element of this landscape is either fruit trees or allotments or things like herbs and so on that there are. So it's not just landscape as decoration, but actually landscape as, as produce and food. And this master plan, which comes, which is a, an, an empty site currently, and is a master plan uh, created by uh, Will also, has a series of cubes that you can see um, along here that are. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a bit it's a bit like uh, New York and Central Park. You leave the big space in the middle and you build on the edges. And one of those cube at the uh, at the center. Uh, we, our client asked us to create a one planet living cube, which would be um, something where you could experience the principles of of the one planet living uh, by touching it. So you could uh, see the rain falling on the roof and being captured into this reservoir, and the reservoir then feeding a hydroponic culture of tomatoes and things that were growing. Then the the the, re the green element is actually a, a, a wind turbine made of rubber that rotates, with uh, and then there would be a, a little center at ground level, and there would be animals providing eggs and meat and so on. 
and that was a, that was very much a conceptual uh, sketch, which led then to uh, a slight refinement of it, because then the client said, "Now I don't, I don't want to just show um, the principles. I want to be able to measure the the principles, and I want the cube itself to become." Um, uh, not just a museum, but a, a place with hotels and restaurants and um, and gardens, and they all every element of this queue has to actually pay for itself in some form or another. And so this is still uh, on on the drawing board and being developed, but it will be, uh, we hope, the the first uh, one one planet living uh, center in England. And then similar, and I think also a very interesting concept. Um, in London, in England, there is at the moment a series of living landmark projects, uh, which will be chosen by the public on television. And so probably 50 cities around the England have been proposing their living landmark projects. And Isling Islington, where I live, in, in the, the Holloway Road in particular, was um, we were approached to ask if we could create a zero carbon, zero waste street. Um, the, the, the concept is that the street itself uses no energy, despite the fact that it has traffic along it. And it's, it is conceptual, and it is in the, its infancy. The idea is that, for instance, you would have on in the middle of the street, you'd have um, supplies of hydrogen for the uh, fuel cell cars of the future and for the, the the buses that exist. If you don't create the fuel cell the petrol st uh, stations, um, then the cars will not come. So it's a sort of chicken and egg situation: recycling of water, uh, car uh, carpooling, bicycles, bicycle supplies. Um, and then there was the NVAC system that, that recycled waste and, and sent it directly to the uh, recycle center. And this, this again was, and also there was this huge funnel that cleaned the pollution of the air and, and filtered it. And then that becomes the, the conceptual sketch and became uh, a drawn sketch. And then this is, this is a proposal or in, in mutation proposal for the living landmark proposal. The street is given back to the pedestrian, is given back to the cyclist. The arches have markets and farmers markets and markets for recycling second-hand goods. Um, and then uh, inside the, the timber structure, a series of um, uh, stations and so on, and a, and a, and a new park on, on top of the bridge. My, my next uh, obsession or passion, uh, there's, a, there's a great link between obsession and passion. I, th I feel that there's something that obsesses me and that becomes passionate and, and actually you, you have to work through your obsession to, to sort of find, find a, a reconciliation in yourself and that's what creates the passions. And, and one of them is I'm not sure if it's it's actually an issue. It might be an issue in South Africa, but it's certainly in, in England it is very much an issue. Which is that for um, for the last forty years, families have been moving out of cities, moving into houses in suburbia, um, because there was there was nowhere to live in the city for families, uh, and also because it has this sort of ideal of the countryside, even though it isn't the countryside, and created a sort of un, uh, centers without culture, a sort of suburban sprawl, which is sort of extended out of proportion. And the cities have lost their children, have lost their sense of family and culture. And so how, how do you um, bring families back into the city? Well, that was the, the question. And it came from a number of thoughts. First of all, of realizing that for a lot of people, home is a house with a garden or a house with an outdoor space, a place for your car. Um, and this is sort of a, a generic idea. And then I gave, I gave a talk about 
um, how to live closer to work lifestyle or how can we get people to move to the city and the gist of it was essentially in a complicated way ten, ten other principles which were to do with how do you make a flat as desirable as a house and over the years certainly in England what's happened is that the flats have gotten smaller and smaller and so first of all you need more space space to entertain space to be separate uh, you need a bit of outdoor space you need a lot of people are very keen and I understand it to have their own front door um, and then to stop having these flats with central corridors like a hotel corridor with some facing south and some facing north you actually need to have to be able to follow the sun and to have dual aspect within your own flat to have storage space like you would have in your attic or in your basement space for the for the surfboard for the pram for the luggage for all those things that don't don't have a home and which end up in in these horrible um, storage places that are in the in the outskirts of town um, room for expansion room also for a certain degree of domesticity to be able to put plants at your on your window to have a beautiful handrail to have all the things that make your 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 home separate from say an office design Pri privacy is about parents and children children having space for themselves and parents likewise and then one of the main uh, issue with uh, with flats probably the one of the biggest issue is the, the, the acoustic separation between um, one flat and the other and I think that's why a lot of people like their house because they don't get the noise of other people and and then also constructing your the flats in such a way that they are not so large in the number of flats that you can't say, sense a, a sense of uh, neighborhood and community. As well as having those ten, princip ten principles of, prop of uh, how to create a home, we also uh, developed ten principles of how to create a place, and I won't go through them all, but suffice to say, uh, a good school, safety, good connection to public transport, um, life lifestyle, health centers, and so on. And, and we've been able to test those principles on the recent uh, master plan uh, also in Manchester for 3,000 homes and we, what we did is to develop four, five, um, well, four, four typologies, four home types uh, that created variety and actually created a very dense urban development uh, very quickly you have uh, the maisonettes, the mews, the the playing fields with the with the allotments and the and the um, um, and, and the playgrounds. You have the uh, mansion blocks on the edge, and then you have the the, the more typical apartments uh, on the ridge. So. Each, each one of these, those mesonets, are actually three apartments on top of each other, the top one being a double height, on the back of which there is a series of cascading uh, outdoor terraces and, and courtyards, and then at the back of that, back to back, a series of, of houses that are actually, um, well, they are, they are three-story three -story houses that, that create a terrace. And I, I'm not sure that this is particularly relevant to South Africa, but it might be, and therefore maybe that's a, a, a case for discussion later on. The Muse creates its own non-through traffic sort of community, whereas the 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 the, man, the uh, mezzanine uh, overlook this park, which is uh, which is semi semi private, but it has playing fields, it has allotments, it has you can see in the distance little huts for people to keep their, their, their tools and very much creating that park, that playing field as a center for the community to, uh, to come together. And the, uh, the other type that we've created is a, it's a 
three three story high um, flat but what is unusual about it is that it's the each flat is six meters high and we've inserted inside it um, a prefabricated structure with bedrooms and, and bathrooms and what that means is that you can you can move, you can you, you create a very cheap volumetric shell in which you have then a, a very cost-efficient prefabricated structure that slots in that is the, that color that element of color in it um, and offer the offer people the possibility of building another set of two bedrooms on top of that existing structure so that you can move from two bedrooms to four bedrooms over time and then the importance of not having to sell your house and move to somewhere else in the future then the, the probably I think it's one of the last um, uh, passion is to do with specificity and, the, and this is relevant to uh, to every piece of architecture which is how do you create something that is um, specific to a certain site and I think that the danger and we all know that from I can I can observe it in Cape Town is that you have architecture that could could be in Cape Town it could easily be in New York it could be in London and therefore in a way it becomes uninteresting I mean it can be interesting but it what what makes it more interesting is that if, if there was a building that was that could only come from Cape Town or could only come from London that would for me be really interesting and it, in before when you went to a, a, a planner and you talked about your building and he would talk about contextualism he would talk about the, the bricks and the similar material you would use or the height of the building and I, I'm interested in another dimension of contextualism which is to do with talking to a community understanding the geography the uh, the weather pattern the materials the um, something that you understand from from the people you talk to that know the place so so very well and some of the projects that uh, I, I want to finish the talk with uh, touch on that uh, sense of specificity this is a, an old um, uh, cinema disused cinema in Bradford uh, with two beautiful towers of the city the people of the city uh, refer to all the time so when we proposed to uh, change this building we decided to keep the towers but to remove the old cinema and to create uh, a series of buildings that were also towers some of which would be hotel others would be uh, offices and others would be residential and underneath that sort of like an open uh, market souk a series of shops that would be a, a, a ground level um, meeting place and in the same way that uh, I understand in Daba means a meeting place discussion place and this is called Casa Mela and the, the, the Pakistani community of Bradford the word Mela means a meeting place also and from that so this is sort of the the first painting the first sketch that sort of helps us to discover the idea we then on then it sort of develops into slightly more buildable forms and uh, scales of hotels and offices but and then introducing this element of the grand stair a little bit like the Spanish steps in in uh, in Rome uh, uh, the Pakistani community loves large weddings with a hundred people and you can imagine them sort of coming down the stairs being photographed these little um, benches on the steps becoming meeting places again and then inside at ground level this, this sort of series of, of buildings and a, and, a, and a, a festival hall and the, the current axonometric Another, another project that was also very much specific to a place was a, a building on the A13 which is a sort of a really busy, busy motorway on the edge of, of London and we were asked to create an incubator unit, a place for small, small offices to, to start up, a startup unit. Um, and so we created this building slightly elevated from the ground in the shape of, of a U 
was it was called the you can it was in canning town and you can start your own your own business on the one side a green, a green wall uh, that was the buffer zone from the and the acoustic buffer from the main road and on the other side on this sort of corrugated metal sheet these uh, different units that, that with their respective uh, steps we were also approached by um, uh, a choreographer who wanted to do a piece about architecture and the city in Trafalgar Square and Trafalgar Square is very large as you know and she needed a space or something a device to contain the dance dance space and, and actually be uh, slightly uh, at the right scale. So we've created this relatively cost-effective inflatable structure that serves as a roof for the, uh, the performing uh, dancers, but is, but is also the place where they can hang from and change, and, and the, the, the inflatable structure then starts to move and responds to the dance below and actually create like a, a giant uh, insect that is moving about inside inside Trafalgar Square. I think maybe one of the last projects I'm going to show you is the uh, science center that we uh, are designing in uh, Not Nottingham where what we wanted to avoid is sort of that sense that you created this, a science center with that it, where the public doesn't feel it is invited so uh, our, ma our main idea was the university is at the very top here and we wanted to create uh, a, uh, an open passage to a, a lake that is uh, a, a fisherman's lake. Another project that is on the drawing board is uh, uh, designed for 46 flats in, uh, in the old mills of Manchester again. And what we've done here is we needed to, take a, to, to build a little higher so we and, and we had to unify a site that was made of several uh, old buildings so the device was uh, a roof that undulates over a series of different buildings and then falls falls round onto the facade of the building with colored glass and again the sketch and then the model which shows the, the current um, sort of exp exploded version of the of the of the current scheme and that's it thank you very much